So welcome to this uh, lecture episode on the future of ground warfare. I am Bruce Oliver Newsom uh, from the University of San Diego, where I teach international relations. I have two special guests with me today, Rafi Cohen and Brandon Valeri Valeri Valeriano. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Valeriano is fine. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Thank you for talking with us. Um, Rafi, could I ask you to uh, give your bio first, foot, please? Sure. So I'm Rafi Cohen. I'm a senior political scientist at the Man Corporation. We're a big um, think tank. Uh, we do primarily defense consulting for the Department of Defense. Uh, my background, uh, I started off my career as a active duty army officer, uh, both as an infantryman and as an intelligence officer. I've spent a bunch of time there in both active and reserve components. And um, I primarily focus on big picture strategy questions um, and work on both Army, but also Air Force issues. In fact, I'm the Associate Director of our Strategy and Program for the Air Force. So, um, you know, I have a foot in both air power and in uh, ground power, and I'm happy to talk about both. So thank you for having me on. Great. Uh, I should say, Rafi, um, I used to work at RAND. I didn't know you. At Rand. I mean, I must precede you by several years at, at RAND. Um, um, I did a lot of work with uh, the Arroyo Center, which is the art. It focuses on the United States Army um, and a bit for the for the Navy. So um, it's good for Randites to get to talk about these things. <laughs> so, uh, Brandon. Yeah, hi, I'm Brandon Valeriano. I am the brand chair of innovation at the Marine Corps University. I'm also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, where I focus on defense policy and foreign policy issues. And I am a senior advisor to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, where we've been reevaluating US national cyberspace strategy. So I have my, my feet in the innovation ground pretty, um, pretty firmly, but also um, looking at strategy and grant strategy. Great. Well, thank you, both. There's fantastic expertise, fantastic crossover here. So I'm, gonna, I'm look, looking forward to this discussion. So the first thing we should do is um, we should set some parameters here. What are the lessons from recent conflicts? And by recent conflicts, I'm, I think I'm thinking particularly of the conflict in Ukraine. So primary, the primary actor here is Russia in Ukraine. Um, so what can we learn from recent conflicts? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll start and then Brandon, I assume you'll jump in. So if we say about Ukraine, I mean, I think the big question is, is Ukraine generalizable to other parts of Europe uh, or to ground warfare at large? Um, yeah, and this gets into questions that we have to think about in terms of Russian logistics, lush, Russian abilities and so forth. There are lessons we learn from it, but, you know, it's important to realize that because they managed to pull off this little green man bit in Crimea, didn't necessarily mean they could pull off the same thing in the Donbass, let alone in other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, I think we have to start with that sort of really key caveat there. But, I mean, we do have some lessons about the ability to project power really quickly, the ability to use, to combine strategic deception and information warfare with actual maneuver on the ground. This is interesting lessons to be learned here on how you cue lethal targets. So, you know, one of the, I did a project for Rand last year talking to Ukrainians about how, you know, use disinformation to order to get Ukrainian soldiers to talk on their cell phones to cue indirect fire attacks. And that's, you know, sort of an interesting tactical innovation there, which could be widely applicable to other parts of the world. Back to what I started off saying is that when we look at any example, and be it Russia and Ukraine, be it US and Afghanistan, be it US and Iraq, any sort of recent ground conflict, you have to begin to start by talking about when are all these conditions actually applicable and all the, all the lessons generalizable to other cases and when, it's, when are they, when they are they or not. And I think that's sort of the starting point for discussion. But with that, Brandon, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one of the key things is that we often fail to learn the lessons because we're looking in the wrong direction. So the current national defense strategy is really focused on a return of great power competition. 
with the wars we've been fighting for the last 10 to 20 years and the wars that have been going on in the international system have profoundly been wars between a major power and a minor power. So I think our framework is quite often wrong and wars between say Ukraine and Russia are more indicative of international world politics. And depending on not if you have a world war is really a question of how many people join the conflagration. So um, the issue here has been quite, um, you know, restricted in terms of uh, how the war has been fought, which has been pretty interesting. Um, uh, the other thing is a lot of people talk about, um, you know, these modern battlegrounds being a test ground. And I really hate that framework because I think the reality is any current conflict is going to be a demonstration of current capabilities. And it's not really an interesting statement to tell us that, you know, we're learning about cyber warfare from Ukraine, things like that. It's just, it, it's not even true really. More often than not, we found that uh, cyber capabilities in Ukraine have been fairly useless in terms of the battlefield, and they often been overestimated. Um, you know, we can get into the crowd strike artillery sort of hack, but that 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 didn't come off the way people kind of suggested it did. And then the other thing is, what's really interesting is the reliance on age-old technologies. So electronic warfare has really come to the forefront in some ways in these engagements. Um, while we look towards these sort of modern innovations of drones and cyber and AI, you know, just old-fashioned electronic warfare is more and more prevalent on the battlefield, especially given Russian capabilities. So there's a lot to kind of look at in terms of what's going on in the current conflicts, but more often than not, we're looking for something different. We're looking for something grander. We're looking for something that fits our preconceived expectations when the reality is we have the world as it is and we have to analyze it as it actually works now. And that really, I see more major power versus minor power conflict. Yes, so Brendan, that's, that's interesting. So you're categorizing the types of wars that we're more likely to face in the future, or at least we could look at it a different way, that the wars that are riskiest, so we should focus on those because they are the riskiest. So, so you're talking about major versus minor wars. Um, <clears throat> we are, we've gone through a period in the 2000s where everything was about stabilization operations. Um, so that's a separate category. Uh, can I just get both of your opinions on how important stabilization operations will be in the future? Well, they're going to be critical. Yeah. I, I, oh, I think what's that. really interesting is that um, when I've been working with the Marine Corps for the last number of years, is the more awareness of other institutions and other arms of American power, especially USAID, um, these sorts of instruments of power are critical, but we don't talk about them in terms of strategy or you know the, the way we kind of debate these things in War on the Rocks. And I, I think there's we're missing the reality quite often. Yeah, I mean, I would I, I would echo some of that, but I would also caveat because I also see when particularly when you talk to Army officers, there's the you know belief in the mystical um, foreign service coming right into your rescue to do a job that frankly they can't do. Uh, you know, 5,000 foreign service officers. So, you know, it's less about the size of an arm, one army brigade. Um, and most of them are not trained to do stabilization type stuff. I mean, it can do great things, but they can do things at bounded level of capability there. And I think the tendency, particularly by active duty officers, to ascribe capabilities that they frankly just don't have. So, I think you have to bound that, you know, what we can actually expect some of the other arms of government to do. Now, you know, we can talk about shifting resources around to make them more robust, but that's a separate question. Yeah. So can we categorize the war in Syria? Because this is a bit of a weird one, because so it's got major actors, it's got minor powers, it's got a lot of proxies in there. There's counterinsurgency, there's major conventional warfare going on. Um, there's all the peripheral stuff. So, so how would the two of you categorize what's going on in Syria and what are the particular lessons from that conflict? Well, for me, it's an interstate war that has um, external joiners. And, you know, that's, that's indicative of most interstate wars. Uh, I don't have the figures in front of me, but the great majority of them have an external partner who will try and engage in hostilities. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. I mean, I would categorize it as classic proxy wars. Some direct intervention. But by and large, you know, most of these sort of head-on, head-on is proxy conflict. Yeah. So it's, it's, 
Right. Uh, so are the lessons from Syria reinforcing the lessons from places like Q Ukraine? Or are they peculiar? You know, I, I really don't know. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting that we don't really talk about Syria that much in the U.S. military right now. And I, I don't know why that is. I, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about that issue until right now, actually, to tell you the truth. I mean, I guess the question is, which lessons are you referring to this? Um, I mean, I think they're all lessons we want from Syria limitations of Russian air power, how they conduct operations. Um, you don't have the same sort of little green men scenario right now that you did in Crimea that you do in uh, that way uh, being conducted in Syria at that time. So I think there's, I mean, the question, which lessons are we referring to? And then we can talk about what's not that applicable. But yeah. So, so let's, uh, let's, let's focus on, on particular lessons. So this is where we want to, um, prospect into the future. So I know you know, both both Rafi and Brandon, you've been involved in studies uh, forecasting the future of warfare in general through uh, 2030 horizon. So that's 10 years from now, which is a good horizon, not too long, but not too short to be useless. Um, <clears throat> so what are the particular trends we should focus on? So um, there are trends in uh, the use of cyber, in uh, conventional warfare to support conventional warfare. Um, the, there's a trend that was particularly uh, well reported from Ukraine of using um, unadmitted military personnel, uh, the little green men. Um, there's a trend towards more remote strike uh, weapons, indirect fire, uh, uh, a trend to, to, uh, maybe against uh, major weapon platforms such as tanks and attack helicopters. So <clears throat> can, we, can we draw out any of those particular trends that you think are most, uh, most clearly evidenced in the recent conflicts we're talking about? Rafi? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the conclusion I come to is that you know, when you sort of aggregate all these trends together, uh, you know, that you have a bunch of different types of conflict emerging. Um, and the problem with military force planners is they drive you in different terms, directions in terms of capability investment. You have the counterterrorism stuff that's not going away. It's been a part of warfare for the last several decades. That's continuing on, you know, be it in places like uh, Mali, be it places like Yemen and so forth. You have sort of gray zone conflict that we see playing out in Crimea or Donbass. A different form of gray zone competition playing out in uh, South China Sea. You see sort of an asymmetric type of conflict. And, when you, and this is less of a term of a trend, but it's where the investments of, say, DPRK or Iran are going in terms of not trying to match US conventional power, power for power, but sort of grounded in some ways. And then there's, then there's a full-on great power competition, which, you know, that's not a trend, but if you look at what Russia and China are investing in, they are investing in high-end conventional military capabilities. So, you know, even though that, that's not necessarily a trend, and I think Brandon's point is well taken, that, you know, more, the majority of conf, the most likely conflict is, has what we mean to be this sort of major on minor power, major power on counterterrorism. There's this dangerous conflict too, and for a military planner, you have to plan against both of them. Um, and then the unfortunate thing for the from the U.S. perspective, and sort of what um, is that the investments that you need for one type of conflict are not necessarily the investments you need for the other. Yeah, and I think I mean that, that we should mention the term over optimization, uh, which uh, is of it's been bandied around as a as a concern for how we adjust. So we need to adapt. We certainly need to adapt to changes in warfare. We need to posture towards uh, new threats or um, we need to adjust our technologies, capabilities, and so forth. But at the same time, we don't want to over-optimize against a particular contingency and leave ourselves uh, under-prepared for um, uh, uh, old-fashioned contingencies, they might see uh, even even contingencies in the 2000s, so counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, stabilization operations, they might seem uh, old-fashioned now already when we're looking forward to great power conflicts in 
Asia Pacific and uh, on in Eastern Europe and even right Arctic we haven't mentioned the Arctic yet mm -hmm. so so we should mention that term and, and keep that in mind as, as we take this discussion but Brandon what do you think are the um, what are the key lessons to take from these recent conflicts sure uh, I'll have two lessons and say two failures in some ways the main thing is long-range precision fires. Uh, I think we're learning more and more that we don't need to put our men at risk, that we can do things from a distance, and we should do things from a distance given the capabilities of our adversaries. So how to deliver fires in a precision manner um, against a less capable adversaries in some ways, I think that's becoming more and more important. And that's why the Marine Corps is moving away against certain versions of helicopters, against tanks, things like that, because it just doesn't fit the battle model anymore. And these technologies are too expensive uh, to be leveraged against an uh, adversary that is low technology and um, and if we can't necessarily support them in some ways. Uh, the other thing is multi-domain battle. Um, that's becoming more and more critical. Um, they're start, the Army starting to push for the mosaic battle concept, this idea of dispersed, distributed uh, operations with long-range precision fires. Getting that sorted is going to be critical because the problem is each branch of the U.S. military is developing their own multi-domain battle system and their own theory of multi-domain battle so you know we of course always have a problem of interoperability with our allies well we're developing deeper problems of interoperabilities issues internally because you know the buzzword at the marine corps and the navy right now is naval integration um and if that has to become a buzzword in your military to get the branches to work together i think we have a fundamental failing from the beginning um the other things the things we don't really pay attention to that we need to more and more is logistics um, a lot of people talk about like war games with China and how we're going to lose. Well, yeah, the, the reason we would lose a war game with China or a war with China is because of logistical failures, because of the distance, because of how quickly we would run out of munitions in theater. So understanding the challenge of logistics and how we meet these challenges is going to be more important into the future. Um, the other thing is denial. I think too much we focus on overmatch and trying to beat our adversaries with advanced capabilities when the reality is that they can use very, very cheap capabilities to deny our operations. So we need to think about how denying them in the first place, or we need to think about how to protect our operations more and more. And this is what really frustrates me about cyber is we often talk about what you can do for cyber from the offensive point of view, but more often than not, you're just as vulnerable from the defensive point of view. And that if you're C2, your command and control is vulnerable to cyber operations, you're not going to be able to do anything in the first place. So just being able to survive and deny the enemy any sort of maneuver is really critical. And I think we failed to, to think through how we would actually do this. Yeah. So Rafi, does that stimulate anything else you want to add on the trends? Oh, I mean, look, I, I, would, I agree with the point about long range precision fires. The question is, can you actually get precision fires if you don't necessarily have the intel capability to sense that far out. I mean, and this gets into like particularly what Russia and China are up to in terms of denial and deception, but even in terms of also, um, you know, less capable allies too, well, adversaries, potential adversaries too. And so I think, you know, the point, you know, the army in particular has sort of invested heavily in long range fires. The question is that's all premise that you have you know exactly where your adversary is, that may or may not actually be true. Uh, if you talk about, you know, a war game, we'll say what a war show, for instance, looks like, more often than not, it's not only the range that gets us, it's actually the volume of fires as well. Um, and that's not also not the point there. And then the second point I would bring up is just to echo, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with Brandon's point about logistics. I mean, this is sort of a truism of every Rand war game is you always run out of munitions long before you run out of platforms to shoot them. And that's, and that plays out over and over again. And I think there's probably bureaucratic reasons why everyone likes to buy the shiny airplane, but not the bomb that goes on it. Um, but, you know, that's, that is really the sort of Achilles heel that uh, we have to continue to fight against. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we could go back to, a not so recent conflict, but it's a recent conflict in Libya, where, um, so we're talking about 2011, uh, where the European members of NATO ran out of munitions within days to weeks and had to be resupplied by the US. So I think that, you know, the, the issue of logistics is is more 
brittle, let's put it like yeah. that, in Europe even than in the US, but the US faces um, those issues too. So that's a good point. Um, I guess we, we should um, now focus on strategy. So how is strategy, so Brandon has, a, has alluded to changes in how we uh, can attempt to defeat our adversaries. Um, so what lessons can we take for strategy in the future? And, and actually we should talk about what strategic changes have already been made. So, so the Navy and the Marine Corps have made some, um, so, so have, have, have implemented, they are implementing some major changes in strategy. So let's talk about those. What are the changes in strategy in this, uh, this 10 year horizon that, that you, sure. you both studied? So let's start with Rafi, I think. <clears throat> sure. So for the Army, I mean, the Army is investing heavily in long range precision fires for some of the reasons Brandon mentioned. It's getting heavier as a force, well, as opposed to the Marine Corps, which is divesting itself of the tanks and so on, becoming more expeditionary. In some ways, going back to its roots. The Army, in some ways, has a sort of similar trend. It, it would desperately like to go back to the tank battle of war. Um, whether or not that makes sense, is that's a question. Uh, I think there's more of a recognition that posture matters. Now, was a, there's a here there's a political disjuncture here, right? Where you know, the overall with the army and most military planets would like to be at forward, um, where the political winds are is not in, not in that uh, favor. For the Air Force, I mean, the Air Force has always, has in some ways, never really got into doing the counterinsurgency fight. That's never where its, head, its mindset has been. Uh, so it has sort of doubled down on not only on the fifth generation uh, aircraft, but also doubled down on looking at remote piloted aircraft and so forth and what you could do with that and trying to divorce itself between being sort of big logistical hubs. Uh, again, those are nightly vulnerable for a high-end fight. Um, and then in terms of sort of arching all of that together in terms of grand strategy, I mean, this is where, I mean, I think there's a debate inside Beltway of how much did the national defense strategy actually change the needle versus reaffirm trends that were already going in that direction anyhow. Uh, but the, other, the bureaucracy has really taken it to heart. So things will you know, every, every project has to be linked back to the national defense strategy. Every program has to be linked back to it. So basically, if it's not about great power competition, it's not getting funded. Now, the interesting question here is whether or not that stays post-COVID. Um, and I think that's a really interesting question, which maybe we'll talk about later on. Yeah, thank you. Brandon? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty interesting too, because like, I know a lot of the people that wrote the NDS, and I know the people who wrote the China strategy, and uh, I, I'm not even sure that they really believe in the strategic kind of doctrine that we're developing, and it's more kind of a, something Rafi's kind of pointing to, it's kind of the bureaucratic push and pulls of where our strategy is developing, and then, um, you know, we're gonna have the issue in November, when, you know, if a new administration comes in, I think they're going to really just throw everything out and uh, we're going to have to reshuffle quite dramatically. And I don't think we're prepared for that transition. I don't think we ask ourselves enough the question of to what end strategy. More often than not, when you discuss strategy in the military or the think tank perspective, it's about a means, but not a means to an end. There's no real end state. There's no real, like, what are we trying to do this for? And more often than not, a lot of these sorts of new technologies are spoken of as kind of these sort of magical additives, you know, like uh, we make the joke with sprinkle a little AI on it, things like that, you know, sprinkle a little cyber. It's, it's criminal how we model cyber and AI in war games, and we're not doing it accurately. And this is really, this should really challenge our conceptions of how we build strategy. And it's really disappointing to see it actually be built at the national level, at the congressional level, you know, at a level from a commission and to see all the bureaucratic infighting, which isn't really about what's the optimal strategy. It's more about what is some particular, you know, GS-14 want to do over someone else. And that's really disheartening. In terms of each branch, um, the Marine Corps is really focused on sea denial right now. So I think that's kind of the buzzword that they're looking at. Um, I don't know what the Air Force is doing in some ways. I, I really think they should be taking the lead on multi-domain battle coordination, especially between cyber and space, but I, they've lost that battle in some ways. The Army is focused on mosaic and dispersed operations with long-range precision fires. And um, there's a big internal battle between 
legacy technologies and the future commands. And the future command doesn't want to mutate. You know, there's things the bureaucrats want, and there's things the people who are actually developing future operational concepts that they don't want. And uh, this idea of a unity of each force just it doesn't exist. Um, and the Navy. Um, I don't know what to say about the Navy because we have a 355 naval end strength goal that um, is in law. And we have no idea how to build it. We have no idea how to cost it. We have no idea how to pay for it. And we don't have a great idea of what to do with these new modern weapons, these new frigates we're building. And we don't know how we're going to really integrate unmanned systems in the naval, um, in the future of naval warfare. So there's a lot of strategic indecision. There's a lot of strategic uncertainty right now. And I, I, I think it goes to, you know, it, it's indicative of the larger, larger American problem of bureaucratic infighting and uh, just, um, you know, the whole Graham Allison of where you sit really matters quite a bit now. Yeah, <laughs> that's all very worrying. <laughs> we just introduced more uncertainty into the uh, into the time horizon here. So, so can we focus on logistics for a moment? Because I think there there are some important parameters to to clarify. So, it, 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 maybe we can think about logistics in certain case studies. So, certainly um, in a confrontation with China, logistics are are, are, are going to be difficult. Um, logistics are also difficult in the Middle East. So say, um, even operating in Syria, that's not easy. Yemen, that's not easy. Um, there are some complications where some of the Middle Eastern countries that we used to uh, pre-position stuff, we don't, for political reasons, it's not so easy to pre-position there. Um, and then even in uh, Eastern Europe, so actually uh, the, you would think the logistics in, in, for NATO would be easier, but they actually turn out to be quite complicated, for, in, in, including political reasons. And then that's before we even talk about the Arctic, which um, is increasingly on the radar, but you know, how on earth do we operate there logistically? So can, can we set some parameters here? What, what do we need to worry about logistically for future ground warfare? So I'll, I'll take a stab at this and then, uh, and I think it depends a little bit, and I think you got to this a little bit in your framing remarks, Bruce, which is you have to worry about different logistical problems depending on where you're at, right? So in the Indo-Pacific, uh, geographical distance is what largely matters, and then the fact that a lot of it is covered with sea. Um, so, you know, you're, that reliance on uh, naval lines of communication really become key. And the fact that we have a fairly small amount of land bases to where you can operate from, all of which are inside the threat bubble. In the Middle East, you know, particularly if we're worried about some sort of the counterterrorism operation, you know, all of Syria, you know, the challenge you face there is political of, you know, who, are, who allows US access? And that's that's a different kind of problem than you find in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, you have, I mean, given like the political concerns with uh, the Philippines today, so there are, there, are, there are political challenges in the Indo-Pacific, but it's a fundamentally different kind of challenge than you find in the Middle East. With Europe, um, then it's a somewhat different set of challenges. Um, you know, for us, it's the political dimension of moving uh, large-scale forces across Europe. So, I mean, the, Europe, uh, the U.S. Army did the uh, Dragoon ride, you know, trying to move a brigade. Off, and it was sort of a PR stunt in one way, but a lot of what they were actually testing was thinking about the political challenges of moving across multiple countries. Um, and despite the fact that you have a somewhat integrated Europe, it's not completely. Um, you have challenges in terms of rail gauges once you move far uh, enough east between you know, Western European rail gauges and Eastern European rail gauges. And then you will also, if, you know, if we assume that the reason why you're moving forces into Europe is partly because you're worried about a Russian action. The idea that you have sort of freedom of movement to, to simply move for mass forces and move them into Europe no longer holds true. You would, if I was about, I would try to interfere with you know, the seas ports, those airport ports, be that via, via cyber, via cruise missiles, and there's a variety of ways you can do this, but you know, that's a different set of logistical problems than you would face in totally in sort of the Middle East Bit. So logistical challenges, the common thing is you have logistical challenges everywhere, but they have a very different stripe map depending on which part of the world you're operating in. Thank you. Brandon? 
Yeah, and I think I, I would take a lot from your earlier comment about, you know, the the political nature of these questions. I think it's really critical. And, um, you know, Rafi mentioned the Philippines. I think that's a critical flex point for us into the future. I think we've really failed to enable our allies. We've really failed to loop in our partners. I think our failure to really build strong alliances and strong institutional partnerships for achieving interoperability has really fallen in the wayside. And, you know, basically in the last three years, but even going back even further than that, I think that's going to be the telling crux point for us moving into the future is that there's the things that we've been doing to break down alliances and institutions. And then you look at what China has been doing to build up the Belt and Road and to support a vast infrastructure network of support for people in their region, which can be quickly converted for military capabilities. And this sort of long range planning is not something that we've even built out internally in the US, let alone externally. You know, our infrastructure is crumbling and our infrastructure externally is even worse off. And I think that's a huge challenge moving into the future. Yeah, well, well said, both of you. Thank